So one of the benefits of going last is I get a chance to see what everyone else has done and how it relates to what I'm doing. So it actually um, follows from some of the work that the two previous uh, authors presented and from a table that Jeff presented. The difficult part is how much of that caffeine is worn off on you guys. <laughs> so we'll see. So let me go back to two previous presentations. And my, if I were to just put that in one capsule, I'd say they're looking at modal choice. Okay. What I will do in this piece is look at railroads, railroads choice of inputs and explain why I think that's important. It relates to a uh, chart that you did, Jeff, where you, the one that Wes Wilson told you to take out, where you show productivity increasing dramatically and rates falling somewhat. Hopefully what this paper will do is address the issue of productivity and just go maybe a step further to see, have these carriers started to use their inputs more efficiently? Okay, so that's really what this is about. So before we see now a choice, the modal choice between rail and trucking, this time I'm looking at railroad carriers' choice of inputs. Okay. And in particular, I want to look at how work rules have affected managerial flexibility. So in some respect, when Chairman Elliott um, is the other labor person here, my background is both labor and transportation, and I would have liked to have heard his response from the union's point of view about what I'm about to uh, talk about. All right, here we go. Okay, that's big enough. Okay, so why rail? There are a lot of very important uh, and significant legislation that started in the rail industry. Just very interesting. So we had the Grange or Granger movement that where the farmers, farmers uh, desire to uh, get lower shipper rate, shipping rates kind of influenced the 1887 ICC uh, Act, okay? Um, so we now have rail initially was the mode that faced most regulation, and this was interstate. So there was uh, interstate regulation before this, but not interstate. So rail is on the forefront. It's also in the forefront of labor regulation. So I, to my knowledge, rail was about the only industry that had its own act uh, with regard to labor imposed on it. So this makes it quite interesting. So what I'm trying to say is there's a reason for us to look at the input market for rail. Okay. And then last, everyone out talked about staggers, but the first act, uh, the first regulatory reform uh, in transportation, we all know that, was in rail with the 4R and then a little more stringent regu uh, uh, deregulation uh, with the Staggers Act. So this is the motivation. It's on the forefront of labor change way back in the early uh, 20th century, forefront on regulation and then forefront on regulatory reform. Okay, so I'm putting the two together. We've had a change in the product market, and we also have a labor market as a result in part of that Railroad Labor Act. We have a labor market that's heavily organized. It still remains heavily organized, still over 80% organized, which is phenomenal. If you compare that to trucking, they went in a completely different direction, and I'll try to explain why I think that, um, that occurred. Okay, so that's the setup. The question is, has the... Um, Succeeding the FORA Act and the Staggers Act, do these carriers have more freedom to choose the appropriate combinations of input relative to labor? So the preceding, two preceding papers looked at the choice of modal choice. I'm looking at one mode, rail, and its choice of inputs. Okay. All right, so just as a way of introduction, there's a nice paper by uh, uh, John and Ted that look at the effect of losing the caboose. And so we have a smaller crew size, and what I'm saying is there's work that's looked at this, work on this area. And they're basically saying, look, this has uh, contributed to a 5 to 8% reduction in cost, and the key here is a result of negotiating less rig rigid work rules. Okay, we don't need the single men, uh, as many switch men, we don't need as many brake men um, on that caboose anymore. So that has allowed carriers to actually realize lower costs, to your point, Jeff, greater productivity. Okay. But we don't have any work that's really looked at whether or not 
they're using the inputs efficiently. And this is where the economists get on, would get on my case. All employers use inputs efficiently. So I've got to show you where I think the inefficiency arises. Otherwise, they're out of business. Okay. So hopefully I can try and show how looking at allocative efficiency contributes to this work on productivity. All right, so this a little history here. <clears throat> okay, so we've had also, uh, before deregulation, we've had uh, imposing, uh, legislation imposing rigid work rules. Okay, so there could be some externality that they're trying to address here. So basically, we're saying that with uh, hours of service, uh, we have a limit on the amount of time that we can force workers to work. The um, carrier may say, well, you're forcing me to uh, employ more workers than I really need to to do my job because of these hours of service regulation. Uh, if we look at the externality, maybe you want to avoid the possibility of accidents or crashes as a result of imposing hours of service regulation. So that's from the point of view of federal legislation. Union negotiation work rules uh, before deregulation were very rigid, and that's my whole point. And I just wanted to, I took labor and I just wanted to take the chance to talk about feather bedding and deadheading. That's, to me, that's fun stuff. But, so, quite interesting. The standard work day before the uh, Staggers Act was based on mileage. So, here's the, so where does the inefficiency arise? So you hit that 100, day, 100 miles within one day. You're paying overtime, and there is no change in productivity for those crew members at all. So that's where you're introducing distortion in the input market. Okay. With feather, feather banning, you're just over, over, you have too many, worker, uh, um, uh, too many workers in your crew. So this goes back to the switchmen. Okay. So it's not doing anything. They're no, they're, no, they're no more productive, but you're paying them this wage that is not commensurate with their productivity. That's the whole point before uh, deregulation. And then there's uh, deadheading. You're paying your workers for non-railroad associated activities. So you're taking some, a crew and you're transporting them from one location to another. That has nothing to do with their uh, railroad activity, but you're paying for that. All these are examples of import distor uh, import input market distortion because wages are not reflective of productivity. Okay, so that's going to, after we have uh, greater competition following the Staggers Act, we should see a, a loss in that, a removal of that type of um, managerial decision. Okay, so the next one should be post. Okay, so we have now, I put technology, but technology was changing anyway um, before uh, the Staggers Act and the 4R Act. But here are key ones that affect labor directly. So we now have electronic switching system. So definitely no need for as many switchmen that we, that we had uh, pre-deregulation. Uh, no need for the caboose in part two. Communication uh, technology allows us to uh, 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 more effectively look at the, um, uh, 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 the routing of our uh, trains. Switching from diesel, from um, uh, uh, coal to diesel, I just thought it got a kick because of uh, the unions, and this is where I would need Daniel, union, unions still negotiated that you must have a fireman in your crew. And I never understood that. And when I first heard the word, I said, why would you have diesel and a fireman? But they did. Uh, so loss of that, less need for the boilermakers and for the welders. Okay, and then um, better track technology. So that reduced demand for maintenance of way uh, employees. So after deregulation, we have this technology change, allows for greater competition, lessening uh, the weakening of the um, rigidity of the work rules. Now this should allow carrier employers to pay wages commiserate with productivity because, the, because you remove some of those uh, barriers from being able to match the wage with productivity. All right. Um, so we have 
weakening of union negotiation powers, a lot of that had to do with consolidation, loss of lines, loss of technology, of course, uh, loss of, uh, for labor demand. Okay, so the unions negotiated, there's, now there were some grandfathered carrier uh, employees in there. So they were grandfathered, they still benefited from deadheading. New employees, no deadheading at all. You don't get paid from being transferred from one terminal to another. For the, those grandfathered, they would still receive, by 1995, they were still receiving um, payment at least for just one day of, trans, of being trans, uh, transferred. Uh, the, this is the key, is number two, the stipulation of a standard workday changed from 100 miles in 1985 for a standard workday to 130 miles by 1995 to where now they negotiate over hours worked, which makes a whole lot more sense. Okay, so that was a key rigidity that's been removed and the reduction of crew sizes. I wanna just do a modal comparison uh, and trucking the IBT, the International Brothers, uh, Brotherhood of Teamsters, were not as flexible as these craft unions that we have in um, the railroad industry. And I think that's why you saw this big drop in union membership and for the Teamsters as opposed to the maintenance of maintaining union membership. They were willing to negotiate these flexible rules. Okay. Well, that's kind of tiny. So what did we see? Initially, with this new labor market, we actually did see a reduction in wages, and then it just stabilized. Still doing much better than you see in the other uh, modal uh, in trucking. And of course, obviously, um, big drop in operative uh, positions. I'm doing this by memory. By 19, 19, I believe 1995, I saw there's 50,000 plus um, brake men and switch men. By 2010, you're down to 7,000. So a dramatic drop in employment uh, in that, uh, although the industry remained highly organized. So they lost workers, but they maintained at about an 80% unionization rate. Okay. But the unions negotiated at pretty much in good faith. All right, we still have the maintenance of federal hours of service, so there could still be um, employment of more workers than you, uh, Carrie, would want to, but again, that may be offset by safety uh, uh, improvement, okay? And in fact, um, safety regulation was actually more restrictive um, after the um, Safety Improvement Act of 2008. All right, so the story I'm telling is this. Prior to Staggers, prior to the 4R Act, a lot of rigidity, okay? deadheading, feather bedding, the whole bit. After that, that's removed for the most part. Do we now see carriers employing an efficient mix, or basically are the wages more commensurate with the productivity? And then that would go to, Jeff, your slide where you see that contributed to higher uh, productivity. Okay. And so I just explained that. That's, that's basically what I just said is this slide. Okay, so excuse me on this. I know I, know I was told not to, not to do triple integration. <laughs> so I'm not, but I, I think that we can call on our memory for, this is just intermediate micro. Just, I want to be able to uh, show a model that explains what's going on with this allocation of input. So, on my, um, I don't have it yet, but on my vertical axis, I'm just seeing labor, and on the horizontal, it's non-labor, okay? And if I can get to it, I didn't come out yet. Um, this is going to be just my output. This is a given output, yeah, it's an isoquant, okay? And those straight lines are my ISO costs. It's just my cost for a given output level, okay? Everything else constant. So, standard microeconomics simply says if I use the most efficient combination of labor, then it's just where I have the tangency of my ISO cost and ISO quant. I'm not, nothing mystical, magical there. Um, so that's without any um, rigidity in the input market, without any regulation on hours of service, without feather bedding, that's what we should get. We should get combination A. That is the combination of labor and non-labor at the wages and price of inputs that we actually can see. But something happens, and that is carriers know exactly the value of their productivity or their workers' productivity. And they're not making based their decisions on the actual wage. They're saying, wait a minute, I've, if we, I have these folks deadheading, 
then obviously I should not employ as many workers relative to my non-labor um, uh, workforce. So that, I guess, orange line, goldish orange line, simply is if you were to have the wage commiserate with productivity, that's what the actual cost should look like. I hope that uh, makes sense, John, makes sense to folks. That's all we're saying. And therefore, you're no longer employing an efficient mix of inputs. That's, that's the paper. Okay. If you were, you would employ more non-labor. That's the paper. Okay. So to sell this, I'm saying employers in the real industry make the decisions based on the shadow input price. Okay. And they know what it is. In other words, they know what their productivity is worth. They know what the real wage should be for their workers. They're saying, look, if I'm being forced through this rigidity to employ all these people, I'm going to wind up, as this graph says, I'm going to avoid that and employ more non-labor uh, inputs. A key part of this, too, is the shape of that isoquant. It's supposed to be. I don't have, there it is. The shape of that isoquant. So earlier, both uh, Daniel and Jared talked about elasticities. And to some extent, what they're talking about is the curvature of that isoquant. Yes, Jared, I don't know where you are, but yes, I'm talking about um, elastic substitution, but closely related to cross-elasticity. <clears throat> so even if there's mild distortion, if that substitutability is really high, we're going to still get pretty big inefficiencies. Okay, so that, I just want to make that point out that elasticity substitution, elastic substitution matters a lot in this story. Okay, so what we really see is if someone were to estimate this, they'd say, well, you should, given the actual wages, we should be employing X subscript L, X subscript NL, but we see you actually employing at XL star and XNL star. And that's because employers know enough about their workers to realize they're paying them too much for their productivity. That's basically all that graph says. So that was my way. Hope that wasn't too much. That was my way of trying to um, uh, model what's going on. Uh, that looks nothing like what it's supposed to look like. So we'll skip it. <laughs> that's nothing close. Um, all, I, all, that, all that says is that's just a mathematical way of saying what I just drew. Okay. But there is something important about it. The way we empirically, so now I do an actual empirical test. The way we empirically test for that input market distortion is as follows. I hope this one comes out. Uh, this is the data. Okay. So I just use class one data. What, we, what I'm going to do is estimate a cost function. And from that cost function, I should be able to distinguish my actual cost from my shadow cost. That's all I'm doing. Okay, so these are the uh, variables that I'm using from the um, class one and reports. So uh, my input, that should be input prices are for labor, equipment, fuel, material, weight, and structure. I'm looking at unit train, uh, gross ton miles, way train, gross ton miles, and through train, gross ton miles. And then my movement characteristics, you can see there are miles of road, <coughs> uh, train miles per hour, length of haul, and a uh, fraction of my, um, of my uh, train miles by caboose, which is a real small, small, small number. <clears throat> okay, the approach, and excuse me for this, that didn't work either, did it? Mm -hmm. So what's, what is there, you just don't see it. <laughs> what's there is a trans log cost function. Jared, Jared, so I didn't do the uh, McFadden. I was able to do a trans log. And if you, in the... Okay. That, that's the equation for the shadow product. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so you just can't see it. It's back there. It's just the shadow. So the only, all they're saying is that the actual cost is the difference between the actual cost and the shadow cost is that um, distortion. That's really all it's saying. Okay. You just can't see it, unfortunately. And so if you were to see it, I would tell you the approach I took. So you have that price distortion. You can't see it. Um, you just you put in your equation and you estimate it using a, a nonlinear in parameters technique. So I'm done. I won't talk about that anymore. Okay. So that's the approach. And the, the results, I just wanted to de describe um, the inputs that we're comparing. I just focused on uh, labor because that's where I believe the distortion comes from. Sigma just means elasticity substitution. 
the curvature of that isoquant curve. The big one is in red. Fuel labor is really sensitive to changes in prices of fuel, which to me makes sense because as we get more fuel efficient locomotives, then you can haul more freight per, per crew. So that's going to be important there. The others, uh, elastic substitution on the significant and for way and structures, actually there's no substitutability, no complementarity. All right, so the big results are this. Besides, showed up. Okay, don't let the numbers in the second column bother you, their magnitude, because the difference, so my fuel was measured in uh, gallons per ton miles. So that, my, um, that small number doesn't mean it's small, it just means that the, um, I'm taking this based on a um, also very small number for the price of fuel. The key is that last column, which is something like a T-statistic, so wall statistic, because I'm taking this relative to uh, zero, um, you get huge distortion for fuel relative to labor. What is nice, just forget about fuel for the moment. The railroad industry is now with less rigid work rules. They are using efficient combinations of labor relative to equipment, material, and way and structure. It's just fuel where we have inefficiency. So for the regulators out there, less regulation is a good thing. And that's what this chart is basically saying. Okay. So my concluding remarks. So basically I just said, my findings are consistent with the view that less rigidity in work rules allows carriers to satisfy allocated efficiency so they're using the right combination of inputs given their wages and given the price of other fact. But, and now you're saying, so, but we know this. Uh, we understand economics. We understand that carriers are always going to make decisions based on efficiency. Prior to deregulation, Kumbacher, I assume I'm saying it correctly, did something similar to what I did. And he found, and he only, but he only had capital and labor, so he didn't have the other inputs. He found actually a lack of allocative efficiency prior to the Staggers and for our act. Okay. And that's so, we found something new. Something has happened since then. That's the key. With regard to fuel, our interpretation of that is um, the inefficiency is simply uh, related to carriers using more fuel efficient uh, locomotives. So any, any distortion in labor input is going to be exaggerated when you compare it to locomotives because they're much more efficient and you're going to switch and use um, more efficient locomotives and move away from that labor. So the more of the story, less regulation has unencumbered carriers so they can make the right decision on their input choices. Thank you. Questions? Oops. Russ Pittman again from uh, Antitrust Division. Um, I, I would ask you to go back, except it's the slide that didn't work. It's John's shadow slide. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm not 100% clear on how you were able to identify or measure the distortion. Yes. Tell me if I'm, tell me if I'm right. What, I, what I'm inferring that you're doing is solving for what the mixes and levels would be yes. if they were efficient based on the input prices. That's right. And then you are measuring the distortion by the difference from that solution. That's exactly what we're doing. Okay. We got so it. and and maybe this would maybe maybe this is already in your paper, but that says to me that what you're measuring is measurement error plus distortion and econometrically you can't tell the difference. You can't. No. Right. So it's like, it's like measuring productivity from the residuals in a, in a right. macro equation. So what are you saying? There's going to be some measurement error. Yes. Yeah, but I can't distinguish that. Yet. Right. There's always measurement error, yeah. and you can't tell how much of that yeah. you, because, for is, is in your measure of distortion. That's it right. sort of comes with the, with the territory. Which makes it even nicer that for the other three inputs, we didn't get any yes. significant. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're right.
Um, if I remember correctly, there was a negative sign on the fuel. So you're so you're saying there, uh, if they had less rigid work rules, no. they would not have gone to uh, such fuel efficient locomotives. That's correct. And see, that's where you run into political things of a lot of people like that. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of government regulators, at least. They want the fuel efficiency. Right. Yes. Yes. But let's look, at, let's look at the other well, Look at the other way. Look at it from the point of view of labor. What that's really saying, we've got this fully efficient alternative. So if we were to remove any remaining um, rigidity or work rule restrictions, then we could obtain both fuel efficiency and have the um, allocated efficiency uh, for input, uh, all inputs. Didn't Kumbakar use a, a frontier estimator? SFA. Yep. Yeah. SFA. He sure did. Is that so what you've was, done? Is that, that's not what you've done no, here, No, no, no. I looked at... Because so, that, that addresses Russell's point about the noise factor and right. actually specifically characterizing the noise in a certain way, and you can separate them out, right? That's right. So. And you're looking at each carrier separately. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you'd done that. I, no, I didn't no, no, think no, I'd no. missed anything, except yeah. the shadow equation. Yeah, so. yeah. It's still in the shadows. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you.